Step Monster in Law, Part 5 Breaking the Devil's Grasp This is a six-part series of the same story, of which you are listening to Part 5 of 6, let's get started. As lovely as it is to hear a title like this, this was not the last time we would listen to Monster. Far from it. But at least it was the last time we had to deal with her physically. So the last time we heard about Monster, she was getting really freaky about being at my birth, despite knowing how uncomfortable it made me feel. Between all the stressful situations she put me through and all the time she had clearly shown abandonment towards my husband and I, something was telling me that it was my fault and I should just get along with her. Please note, to this day, I still feel responsible for a lot of the stuff she said, but there are lovely people in my life who have confirmed with me that these are not things I could control or handle. Not to mention all the other people she screws over during this process, making me realize that the issue was her, not me. So it is 1am, on March 18th. My water breaks, after some stress shuffling into a car and an excellent hobble to the doors, where I am wheeled up to the labor unit, my husband starts to let everyone know about Code D. So obviously, I am stressed and having a ton of medical issues. I was horribly preeclampsia, my blood pressure was through the roof, and I was so nervous about this being my first baby. My mother got to the hospital with my father because she would be back there with my husband and me. I was calming down with both of them there, and the pains weren't quite as bad as I expected, even when we got into the more significant contractions. I even opted out of the medicine at first, thinking I wanted to have this completely natural. However, the nurse put a catheter in me because of the preeclampsia, which caused severe problems. The catheter put so much extra pressure on me during birth that it sent me into painful spasms. They eventually had to give me medicine, but I wouldn't stop jumping around because of the pain, so they couldn't put the needle into my back. After taking the catheter out, the big contractions didn't have me jumping at all, and the nurse looked so shocked, she even asked me, was it hurting that badly? Yeah. Anyway, so one harrowing birth later, and I was onto my next fear. My daughter was bluish and they couldn't get her to cry at first. My husband was so nervous that he was saying his usual bad jokes to cope, and I was in tears, praying that she would start crying. She did, and they took her to NICU for about an hour. But she did great. Now reminder, I am exhausted and have been in labor for almost 24 hours. My water broke just before 1 a.m., and my daughter was born after 5 p.m. So it was a long day. I did not need the added stress that came past 6 p.m. when Monster started more drama. We had set it up because we wanted the biological grandfathers to come and see their grandbaby first. It had been a long day, and most of them were in the waiting room all this time. Not to mention my aunt had brought her children to see the baby and they needed to get home ASAP. So our plan was to let the grandfathers in first and then let Monster come in with my brother, aunt, or one of my cousins. So we could get everyone out of there as soon as possible because it was so late. Lo and behold, the only one who had an issue with this was Monster. Everyone who came in was so mad at Monster for the disgusting display in the waiting room. That woman was causing a huge scene and forced my Phil to stay behind so he would walk with her. This made it hard for things to go smoother. Not to mention that this this made things difficult in the long run because the way we set it up was to give the grandparents more time with the baby, but because of her selfishness, my Phil now had the least amount of time with his granddaughter. Because of visiting policies and such, there was only so much time they would each get, and the nurse was bringing them out based on how we told her, so she was pretty appalled with how Monster was acting like a child. I even commented that I don't know if I should even let her in with how she behaved but decided anyway. Then the weirder comments started to come in. We were all pleased about my daughter's healthy birth, but Monster kept commenting on how long it had taken and why they had to wait in the waiting room for so long. Note, anyone who has not had a child. The most extended recorded birth was 75 days. Not hours. Days. It is a long process. I would also like to note that he did not shout she's here. In his text when my husband told everyone. We made it well known that Code D was mama is in labor. Another thing, they were there for hours and had plenty of time to leave and get things done if they didn't feel like hanging around, so the fact that she was like, pawning this off on us made it super disrespectful. Especially when you know how many complications I had while giving birth. It is not magic. The baby doesn't just pop out after you go back there. At least not with your very first birth. Another comment that really had my husband in a twist was when she held my daughter and claimed, I don't know how it happened, but this baby got some part of my DNA in there. When she left and we had a chance to talk, he expressed how uncomfortable it made him feel that she was trying to put herself into our baby. She was not biologically related to either of us in any way, so it was strange at first. However, what was worse was her repeating this exact phrase multiple times in and out of the hospital. So skip forward to not even three weeks out of the hospital. I am still getting used to being a new mother and my daughter was three to four days away from being three weeks old. Note, multiple people came forward and told us they had no problem babysitting or helping out while I was healing, which I appreciated. 
However, I was doing okay and needed to get back into the swing of things. We were trying to catch up on a ton of laundry because we only recently bought a washer and dryer of our own and had months backed up. It was not okay. So in comes Monster. We had been going over there every once in a while after my one to two weeks. She didn't feel comfortable coming to our house, assuming because she couldn't smoke her weed because of my allergic reactions. More importantly, we wanted Phil to see her since this baby was so important to him. As mentioned before, several people came and told me that if we should need a babysitter to call. However, Monster took it to an entirely different level at this point. It was going on 8.30 at night, and we needed to get home, but we had to go to the store first. Phil makes a comment that they could watch her while we went to the store and then we could come back to pick her up. We politely declined because we were low on gas and it was late. On top of this, there were several issues that we were not comfortable with. The dogs didn't listen to them at all. One jumped up on people regardless of if they had the baby in their arms and the other was prone to chewing on the backs of people's heads. Not to mention their high-pitched barks were so aggravating and annoying to anyone, let alone a newborn who was trying to get some sleep because it was late at night. As mentioned, we were low on gas at this time and driving all the way to the store coming back and then driving home would be way out of the way since it was a short distance from the store in our town to our home versus our town to another city for my fill and then back to our house. The cities were right next to each other, only a 15-minute drive, depending on traffic, but it was still out of the way. Finally, my Phil didn't have baby equipment over at their house. The closest they had was an elephant rocker for furniture. We were out of diapers in the diaper bag, all but like two, and her rag was covered in spit up. Not to mention they had no formula and she just sucked down her last bottle. So if she woke up like she was prone to, she would need her mother for food because we were breastfeeding. This was when the issue started. We politely declined, telling them in the most sincere way possible we weren't comfortable with that. From the kitchen, we can hear Monster getting aggravated. She starts to roll her eyes while cooking or something, saying how they are more than capable of handling a baby and I would need to cut the umbilical cord sometime. I remind you, I was not even three weeks out from my very first pregnancy. This crazy lady was already telling me that I should just start handing my baby over to people when I had no logical reason to do so. We were short on gas, they had no supplies, and if none of that mattered, the least that she could do was think about my emotional state at that time. I am a first-time mother who has never been away from her daughter. It wasn't easy for me to just hand my baby off, even to someone like my Phil, who I trusted with my life. Monster even brought up how she refused to let anyone watch her child for the first 10 years of her life when it was her very first pregnancy. So trying to berate me for not wanting to leave my daughter within the first, not even three weeks. Get over yourself, you selfish so. If that wasn't bad enough, my husband's comment threw her over the top. Trying to keep the peace, he politely informs her that no one on either side of the family has watched her yet because she is so young. He even added how my parents haven't even gotten to watch her yet. Hearing this, she blew up. Suddenly, she starts shouting and throwing dishes into the sink left and right, hollering why does it have to be a competition? My husband was furious at this point and about to tell her he had had enough of her attitude when my Phil just shakes his head. You could tell this was a regular thing between them because Phil looked so tired and didn't want us to make things worse. We left after her tantrum and didn't talk to them for about a week or two. Her messages, we ignored or sent one-worded responses. Now we were having a ton of conversations about what we would have to do. Clearly, she was too overly emotional about everything going on, and she wasn't starting to think straight, and this was also around the second time that I had noticed my daughter getting a rash when we were over their house. So there were clearly things that needed to be discussed. Nothing seemed to be done, however, until the day after Easter. I had prepared for the family to come and take pictures with us professionally at Walmart. Note, I had asked Monster to join us to multiple things things up until this point that she refused to go to, explaining that she wasn't feeling well. So, I brushed her off as usual. However, this time, I invited her and my Phil to join us for these photos with my husband's aunt so we could have both sides join us and it wouldn't just be my side of the family. We were trying to be inclusive. Monster claimed they had bronchitis the week before and were still taking the medication all week long so they didn't want to make people sick. Now, I was a medical student. A little bit of information here, after 48 hours of taking medication, you are no longer contagious to whatever they prescribed you for. The only reason you should be concerned is if you are still showing signs or symptoms. This was incredibly upsetting to my Phil who wanted to be there and admitted they both felt fine. So come Easter, after she had brought up that she wanted to take professional photos with a friend of hers, this was never mentioned again. I had brought it up and even took the liberty to try and invite Monster's aunt and uncle to the photos. I carefully explained how they weren't feeling well. 
and couldn't make it to the ones I had paid for, so I wanted to invite everyone, including them, because they were family too. She sends this long, entirely out-of-line text about how I was in the wrong for asking her family about that, saying that I was disrespectful and how dare I ask her family to do that in front of them because they were so embarrassed. At this point, I had had enough stress from this witch and I will admit happily that I blew up on her. I sent her an equally long message, explaining how I was so sick and tired of her constantly trying to make me out like the bad guy. I was only trying to include them to make them feel like they were a part of the family and how I wanted them around, but all she seemed to do was back out, making some lame excuses about how she was never feeling good. I made sure to include multiple times in the message how she was just the stepmother and I was just as happy if I didn't have her around if she genuinely felt like my including everyone was such a burden. Note, despite my rage, I was crying to my husband about this the entire time because of the panic attack she had given to me and he had to leave work early to come care for me. This was the day before the final straw. Until this point, my Phil and Monster had made it quite clear that they didn't mind talking with my husband without me there. To this moment, they had asked to speak with him without me on several occasions. So assuming they would give us the same courtesy, we asked for my Phil to come over to discuss how to handle his wife politely that wouldn't cause her to blow up. His response sent my husband into a rage and I was so depressed over the entire ordeal. All these times that they told my husband they wanted to speak with him without me there, treating him like a child who should just listen to his daddy all the time despite being a grown man. His response broke us. How do you think Monster would feel if I went over there to talk to you without her? My heart shattered. To think, not only had we gone along with all the times they split us up to talk behind my back and we were perfectly okay with it, but now, he was blatantly telling us that he didn't want to do the same because it would hurt his wife's feelings. Seriously, so you are basically telling my husband and me that you don't give one damn about my feelings when you talk behind my back, but it is a big deal to talk to you without your wife present at all times. I was literally in tears, sobbing and driving an hour and a half away to meet up with my husband, the baby in the back seat. I had explained to dad that we wanted to talk to him about all the things that needed to be discussed before we could move forward. His response was that we were going to lose Monster if we ever told her any of this. I was devastated and actually sent her the first text, trying my hardest to explain without throwing her off, I gave her every detail of what was wrong told her my husband and I had set ground rules if we were going to continue this into the future. I mentioned first and foremost that my daughter was having allergic reactions to something in their house, so going forward, we didn't want her over there without one or both of us present to figure out what was causing it. I brought up the fact that I think it was the weed smell because of the reactions I get medically when over at their house, but never outright called her out on it. I also mentioned the dogs and how they were always a mess and we didn't feel comfortable with her watching the baby without someone there because of the medical problems she kept babbling about. Note, since the beginning of the year, she claimed to have a giant tumor behind her ear that could kill her any day and she would drop dead. I already mentioned how the dog in her house eats the back of people's heads and if she were to drop dead, it would basically mean that my daughter is dead too because no one would be there to notice. Considering my father's shift was 12 plus hours long and my bill no longer there. Despite bringing up all of these, I feel very logical reasons to set some ground rules, she tried to turn it back on us by saying we were just not okay with her smoking weed, a topic that we had mentioned multiple times. We were apathetic about her smoking as long as she kept it away from me because of my allergic reactions. She then proceeded to completely jump over the fact that my daughter was having allergic reactions at all, claiming that she always cleaned the house with bleach before we came over. Note, only once did the house ever even hint of bleach and not very strong, like she may have wiped the counter. My husband almost took the phone, called her, and told her how done he was at this point. But in comfort to me, he sat beside me as I sobbed in his chest and tried one last alternative to this. I could have very quickly just called it quits since she clearly showed no sympathy or emotion to the fact that my daughter, her supposedly beloved grandchild, was having some pretty severe allergic reactions at their home. But instead, she basically proved that her weed was much more important to her than the family ever would be. I asked her if she wanted to be a part of my daughter's life, to choose a time and place comfortable to her that wasn't their home, and we would be happy to bring her there. Her response sent me into a panic attack, and my husband was so furious, he was about to cut ties with both Monster and my Phil. No, in response to my wanting to be a part of my daughter's life, I can't bond with something being dangled over my head like a carrot on a stick. This was the final straw. We both saw red. 
the rest of her incredibly long and pointless message meant nothing to me from there. Not only did she tell me that she did not want to be a part of my daughter's life, but now she was also calling my daughter a thing, an object that she didn't see fit to play with because it would no longer amuse her. We were done, and despite my father still being caught up in her web of deranged tales, I somehow managed to convince my husband not to lose contact with him. Thankfully, as proven by the most tragic death in my life, I am a massive supporter of my grandparents. I would die before I let anyone get in the way of my kids being around their grandparents. My own grandfather was the one who taught me to do most of the things I know how to do today. If I ever lost him, which I had, I would be devastated. When we lost him, it was the only time I had ever fallen to my knees in agony and cried harder than I ever have. On his birthday, I spent it silently looking out on the lake we had shared so many memories on. He was not just a person, he was my hero. I can still remember people asking me in school who my favorite superhero was, and my response would be him. So despite all the terrible things that my Phil had been okay with or allowed to happen up to this point, I convinced my husband that we needed to keep him around for my daughter's sake. I convinced myself that if she wasn't around, he would go back to his usual, carefree self and wouldn't become this heartless man that he had grown into. I even thought that he would eventually see the error in her ways and come back to apologize. Thankfully all of this did come true, but not before a year of heartache. Join me next time in the present day tale of Monster-in-Law, Part 6 Threats, Lies, and Alibis. Don't miss out on the twists and turns in the last part of this series. See you in the last Part 6. Threats, lies, and alibis. Stay safe and stay